Um, my name is Philip Ballister. I am OpenSDR, and uh, I do a lot of work for Matt Edis on his embedded product line. So uh, Tom's asked me to talk about embedded stuff this afternoon. Um, it will be a little bit impromptu because I've had a fairly hectic travel ske schedule for the past month or so, uh, largely due to the device on my left on the screen, which, as Matt announced uh, the other day, sorry about that, is the E200. And we'll leave that up so you have something to look at while I talk. Um, so GNU Radio um, started out as an x86 project and still to this day has a lot of uh, uh, history due to the x86 or engines. Essentially, the x86 is a very big, very fast processor, and it was getting faster and faster every year. So if they had computational problems, they could pretty much wait six months, and Intel would solve the problems for them. Um, in the embedded space, where we want to have smaller radios that are still software-defined, we don't really have that driving force um, making the processors faster and faster. Um, tablets are helping, but the, the, the leaps and bound gains are tempered by the embedded space also having fairly strict power requirements. So we don't get to throw large amounts of power at the problem um, while still trying to have fairly high performance systems to run GNU Radio on. So we kind of struggle with um, some of the history of GNU Radio making it difficult for us on embedded systems. So some of the things that um, I know I have noticed in the past year or so, I believe this spring we noticed that one of the transmit modulators, the angle modulator, was using uh, calls into LibC for sine and cosine, which are horrible to do, even on an x86. But nobody really noticed on x86 because they had extra cycles to spare in many cases. So nobody really noticed until somebody, I think, believe posted on the GNU radio list that you know they were running this and the CPU usage was horrible and what's going on. And I looked at it and I realized it's sine cosine. And all we had to do to fix that was to replace it with a call to the GNU radio call that did a table lookup to calculate the same thing much, much faster. So when you're looking at GNU Radio on embedded systems, we're looking at this as a work in progress where we really all need to work together to improve GNU Radio, um, looking for the low-hanging fruit like that. Uh, the other thing that's been a really big help in the past you know, six months or so is the increased use of Volk. Um, once again, Volk is primarily right now set up to do x86 work, but there's the framework is now here for doing NEON, um, which we'll talk about in a second. So Volk basically provides us a way to get um, SIMD accelerations into GNU Radio, and then they will flow everywhere into GNU Radio that uses those kernels. And I know we've had some extensive talks on Volk, so you can sort of see how that all goes together. Um, one of the sets of kernels that has been done for Volk, uh, largely by Nick Foster of Edis, is he put in some for uh, something called ORC, which I believe is optimizing runtime compiler. So what it does is it uses a pseudo language to describe the operation, and then you compile it with the ORC compiler, uh, link it together into ORC, and what ORC will do is choose a SIMD, a suitable SIMD implementation, both for the x86 versions and for um, the ARM versions. So you basically get about 60 to 80 percent SIMD improvement um, across all platforms. So it's kind of a, a good entry into getting uh, improved performance. And so now that Volk is going to be driven more into GNU Radio, we can start to focus work on Volk and get a lot of improvement there. Um, and once we get the uh, ORC stuff in place, then we can worry about um, getting the last 20 to 30 percent out of that by doing specific neon um, hand-assembled stuff. And there you can worry much, much closer about register scheduling and stuff like that. Um, for those that don't know, uh, neon is basically the ARM version of uh, SSE, for example. So uh, neon uses, you know, basically 120, uh, 
basically you get four floats per register, so you can do four floating point operations in parallel. It's sort of the rough, you know, how parallel it is. Single SIMD is single instruction, multiple data, just for people who don't have that background. How many people have some familiarity with NEON and ARM stuff? Okay, so small group. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about embedded software radio history. Um, in the beginning, so we have the canonical software radio, and we've seen the slide a million times where we have a PC, a general purpose processor attached to an FPGA. And that's pretty much the canonical processing system for a software radio. Um, and the, the history here is, you, I, the people have been doing software radio for a very, very long time, but for the, in the embedded space, the things you've had to play with in the past, um, Intel, um, Xilinx has these nice FPGAs and they put a PowerPC in it. Um, the implementation they had of PowerPC plus FPGA wasn't particularly helpful for software radio because it was, uh, there was no floating point unit in the FPGA, in the PowerPC. And to boot the PowerPC, you had to load the FPGA fabric so that you had some of the peripherals for the PowerPC. So the, the, the workflow was very difficult, um, and it was just a very difficult system to work with, and I never really got exploited as much as it could have. Um, I came on the scene um, around 2004, 2005, as a master's student at Virginia Tech, and at that point it was very popular to try to hang OMAPs off of FPGAs, and I know of a number of commercial vendors doing stuff like that. Um, at that time, it was an OMAP-1, which was ARM-9. The ARM-9 basically was uh, an integer unit only and had a C55 DSP hanging off the side of it. So there was kind of a model for a while of FPGA, TI DSP, um, low-end ARM going around. Um, and I did my master's work playing around with that, um, working with Aussie and GNU Radio and showing that you could run it on ridiculously small processors. I think one of the early embedded runs of GNU Radio, someone ran uh, dial tone on their open MoCo phone, which was kind of nuts, uh, because here you are running a software radio on a hardware radio making a tone, and it was an interesting demonstration with very little you know, use. Um, so the OMAP line jumped to the two, which wasn't really a consumer part, so it wasn't accessible to the masses. And then TI did the OMAP3, which they did as a catalog part, which basically means you could order it from DigiKey. Um, and that's sort of a big change from the OMAP2, and unlike the OMAP4, which is also not a catalog part. The OMAP3 is a Cortex-A8 machine um, from ARM, which is basically a fairly high-end ARM V and 7 instruction set. So with ARM, you, you would hear about ARM9 but it was an ARMv5 instruction set. So there's a lot of wording going around there that confuses people. So ARM9 was ARMv5 with some letters after it, depending on some details. Cortex-A8 is sort of the CPU architecture running the ARMv7A instruction set. And ARMv7 may or may not have the NEON coprocessor, which is what became really exciting when they introduced the Cortex-A8. So with the Cortex-A8, you've got access to the NEON unit, and there's also a vector floating point unit that is not a vector floating point unit. Um, and I believe Tom will have some comparison between that and the A9, which is where we're at now. So with the OMAP3, is designed as a, a system on a chip, a SOC, for doing cell phones. So we're kind of not the target market for that particular part, but it's readily available and has a memory controller on it designed to talk to NAND flash, NOR flash, and some things like that. So, you know, basically, if you remember your 16-bit micro, the bus looked pretty much like, you know, 16 bits of address and 16 bits of data and uh, address latch strobe and a clock for doing some synchronous stuff and, and read and write strobes. And that seems like it would be fairly easy to attach to an FPGA, so Matt and I worked together on the E100 product line that had 
an FPGA hanging off of the general purpose memory controller. And that turned out to work pretty good. You can get samples out of the FPGA into the, uh, the Cortex-A8, do processing, do processing in the FPGA. Um, the interface is a bit problematic, it turns out, um, due to some quirks in the memory controller, but we got all those sorted out and can move samples across at a reasonable rate. One of the headaches with this approach was um, the FPGA could not bus master into DDR, which turned out to be a bit of a drag on things because we have to have the ARM side initiate all the transfers, um, which is suboptimal for doing what we're doing, it turns out. But, you know, when, you, when it's what you've got, it's what you've got. We can get plenty of megahertz of bandwidth into the ARM. So that up until recently was pretty much state of the art for doing, you know, embedded software radio. Um, finding someone's low end, finding someone's arm sock that was a good fit for your FPGA interface. And meanwhile, Xilinx has not been, you know, idle. Um, and they've been talking about this zinc part for several years now. Um, does anyone remember when they publicly announced it? Um, so it's been one of these sort of like they publicly announced it and I know I was at a show where they showed the mock-up board, you know, with half a dozen FPGAs. This is our zinc processor. And it's like, well, but you've got to get it on one chip. So the silicon birthing process has been kind of painful. And I'm guessing they're probably about nine months to a year behind where they said they were when they started announcing this stuff. So everybody that has seen the block diagrams and things has been very, very excited about this part um, because it's a very logical progression of a bunch of stuff. It's, it's now the focus is going to become how to do better design software radios rather than figuring out how to hang an FPGA off of something that's not really designed to talk to it. So we're very excited about that. The next big thing in the Zinc is it has the next big thing from ARM, um, which is the Cortex-A9, which is basically incremental improvements over the A8. Basically, I feel like they fixed a lot of problems in the A8 and made it faster. Um, it's also a dual core A9 in the zinc part, so instead of having one processor, we now have two. So you're now basically, you're, you're now running symmetric multiprocessing. Um, some other key features of the zinc is, um, let me switch my, uh, if, does anyone have any questions? Because this is going to work a lot better if you guys ask questions. Does, before I start talking about the zinc, seriously, does anyone have any questions about, you know, things that have happened in the past? When, when is the E200 coming out? When is which coming out? The E200. Uh, that's a Matt question, and I believe he said when he announced it yesterday that there would be engineering samples first quarter. Okay, yeah, that's right, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, and he's not paying attention. Okay. <laughs> engineering samples of the E200 first quarter next year? Hmm? What did he say? Beta units. Beta units. I said engineering samples because it sounds better. <laughs> um, there I go ad-libbing and getting off script. So OK, so nobody wants to talk about the past, so we'll talk about the future then. Um, this is directly from the Zinc TRM. Uh, which is basically available to registered users on the Xilinx website now. Um, so we can see that we have the Cortex-A9, two of them, the standard caches, the FPU and NEON engine. I'm pretty sure by FPU they'll mean the vector floating point unit that doesn't do vectors. Um, we have your usual standard I.O. peripherals, uh, the particularly exciting ones. Um, okay, Tom, Tom's going to cover that one better. Um, but basically, they're two floating point units of varying degrees of performance levels. Um, and every time, it's just Tom will talk about that. So, but that, that's why you see sort of references to two floating point units there. 
Um, and Tom will talk in some detail about what they're good at and blah, blah, blah. Uh, standard I.O. stuff. Um, the exciting stuff is the gig E stuff. So now uh, the E100 is basically 10 megabit, and you probably can't really get 10 megabit because it's on the same bus as the FPGA, so you basically are going to starve the FPGA. It's basically shared access. Uh, you notice these lines here are showing you the direction of the arrow basically means the gig E unit can bus master. So you can, it, it should have a little DMA controller in it, and it can bus master, and if you follow the directions of the arrows, you see that you go through the central interconnect out to the memory interfaces. This is the DDR controller. So you have reasonably fast DDR memory with a controller on it that, you know, so you have a high bandwidth path to DDR from the gig ethernet. So if your driver is set up properly, um, the gig e can read and write DDR without needing the ARM to do the copy to from. So these are big potential performance improvements uh, depending on how Xilinx has written the Linux driver right now. Uh, two gig e ports, two USB, two SD. Uh, if you notice the E200, probably will have one of each. You have a DMA controller accessible to the ARM. On-chip RAM. And the exciting stuff is the programmable logic down here. J just to be clear, these are not data flow directions. They're master directions. So basically, the arrow points to the slave. So basically, what that means is the master can initiate bus transactions downstream by following the arrows. So to make that, let's see if I can find a good example. Um, so everyone can talk to the RAM, the on-chip RAM. Everyone can talk to the memory. The central interconnect is basically a crossbar, so it'll slow things down going through it. And the key things here are the general purpose ports and the high performance ports in the programmable logic. So what this means is there's six ports in the programmable logic where your logic can basically speak directly to the memory. So the way this is going to work is the FPGA, instead of the ARM deciding when to read and write from the FPGA, the FPGA will decide where, where, when and where to put data and then coordinate via some control ports here. So what will happen is we can offload a lot of the overhead of doing data transfers directly into the ARM. And that this should be a big win for having more computational time available in the ARM and just lower overhead transfers. Um, the bandwidth numbers into DDR are pretty big, so conceivably you can move high rate data and have the ARM all accessing DDR and not running out of memory bandwidth. So there's a lot of a lot more speed in here than the old A8 design. Um, the OMAP design had a relatively slow memory bandwidth. This has much, much faster memory bandwidth. Essentially, if you played with an A8-based E100, most of the problems you would have seen in that have been affixed by this architecture. Uh, another big key on this compared with the earlier Xilinx products is the PowerPC unit, you had to load the FPGA first. In this, the ARM can boot standalone without anything in the FPGA. And then the ARM can load the FPGA itself. And there is support for doing partial reconfiguration in the loading. So you can sort of control where you send the bit stream. And hopefully Xilinx has their act together finally on partial reconfiguration and makes that accessible to us, the mere mortals. Uh, which would be very exciting. Um, for people who worry about secure boot stuff, there's some various secure boot modes as well so that you can uh, load encrypted bit streams at boot time and not mess with things. Um, Xilinx has a lot of stuff about that website. Um, 
All right, at this point, does anyone have any questions? Yes. Oh. Uh, Coming out of Xilinx, I don't know. I've seen everything running on these. I mean, basically, it's whatever you like. But oh. Uh, yes. I mean, you can make something that looks like what you have on the E100. I've seen various distros running on these at um, a Xilinx X, uh, Avnet XFest. Xilinx itself, software support, um, is suboptimal. Um, I think they shipped a crappy root file system that loaded on a RAM disk. Um, I've seen Xilinx or Wind River has done a Yocto board support package. I've done a board support package. Yoc uh, Xilinx has bought Petalinux, so there's a lot of flux. If you want to know what Xilinx is going to do, I have no idea because they seem to be doing a lot of different things, which is probably the right thing um, because really they're in the business of selling silicon not really selling software. And if they're going to work on software, I hope they work on their tools. Um, I mean, obviously, we have it booting Linux now, and we can run simple tool chains on it. We do crossword, all that stuff. Anyone else? Yeah, whatever you want. Whatever you... Um, something based off of Yocto, basically, based off the Yocto project. How that gets branded, you know, it's just, you know, whether they're binary feeds, things like that. I mean, right now, the, the big focus with the product is getting the interfaces so that we have UHD running and we can give samples and things, right? So the E200 basically will sh be fairly full featured with lots of stuff on it so that you can get up and running fairly quickly. Um, and then I think once you have solid applications in place, you know, just depending on your needs, you customize to whatever you need. I mean, basically, you get everything you need to make it work. And there is lots of support in the embedded Linux community if you want to roll your own stuff. Um, there are lots of consultants out there who will help you. And you can twist it to meet your own needs. Um, what, what will ship on it is probably far beyond what most people will need, but it will make it easy for them to get started. Okay. So since we're at a GNU radio conference um, talking about embedded stuff, the real thing here is we, we need to talk about how to make GNU radio run better on this. Um, and this is where I'm going to need you know, audience assistance. Thank you. Um, I mean, I know of things that need to be done in GNU Radio to make this better, and I talked about a lot of those in some of the work that we've seen here, the Volt stuff. You know, we have a path to integrate Neon and stuff like that um, via Volk. So, you know, that's a good place if you want to help out get GNU Radio work, working better on embedded systems. Um, we also need to drive towards more of a zero copy architecture in GNU Radio. Um, in the E100, the data flow is such that the data comes out of the FPGA into DDR, into RAM, and then UHD does a block where it converts the data to float. So it basically does a copy while converting to float and then moves it into the GNU Radio buffer system so the GNU Radio can then pass it around. One of the big wins in this architecture is going to be the pipe between the FPGA and the RAM is so fast that we can afford to do the convert to float in the FPGA. But now the problem is UHD is going to copy it into a piece of memory that may not be well integrated with the GNU radio buffer system, leaving us with a place where we just have to do a blind copy. And anytime you're running a mem copy, you're burning a hole in your processor, and it's a bad idea. So we're, we're thinking about how we can move data straight from the FPGA into GNU Radio's buffer space. Um, you know, that's certainly one of the challenges. The big challenge I see with GNU Radio um, 
Has anyone here done any work on an embedded stuff where they could see other things that GNU Radio needs help with? Um, I know people have talked about blocks that just process data and don't have any output need a copy in GNU Radio right now. And that would be a big win to figure out how to remove unnecessary copies from GNU Radio blocks. Um, yes? Okay, so there's issues with you know how the cache works. Um, so when you reduce the number of copies, you may not save time because the big time may, might be going through cache. Um, in this, the big time might be just getting the cache loaded in the first place. Doing that one, doing, doing that one copy primes the cache for your subsequent operation. Um, Yeah. So, but the idea here is I think we would have better um, localization of the operation if we didn't have to bring it through the cache once. Because chances are, as we stream in samples, they're going to get processed later. So what will happen is they'll go through the cache, then get flushed out by the processing blocks, and then get sucked back in when they get processed. Um, it's basically sort of some architectural things that we need to think about that I think would be a win in this case, even given what you're saying. Um, just because of how the queues are going to, the buffers are going to fill. Is, is kind of my gut feeling. Measuring cache stuff is, is just a pain. So we'd like to, if we can do design stuff to make it so that we don't have to do those copies, I think we're better off. So we, we need to think that way um, as much as we can. Certainly in the case of the blocks that don't have any output, so avoiding the input to output copy, basically the output becomes the input, but they're going to get primed into cache anyway because the operation is probably going to be to scroll through and make some decision based on the contents of the buffer. So by not having to write it back out, you might have a bit of a win. Um, So the other thing that happens when you go to Zinc is you have something we don't know what to do with. There's a thing called the ACP port, which Xilinx calls the advanced coprocessor port. And this is designed to be a way to do medium length accelerators. And I don't know what the word medium means. Um, I've been reading the, TR the TRM to try to figure it out. and it's. I, I'm figuring like a K, a K, a few K of data. And what it does is it avoids some of the cache management issues. It'll go and re, it's, it uses the snoop unit. And where you see the word snoop controller, just substitute magic. Because apparently it will do magic so that when the FPGA, if we remember from earlier, the arrow points there. so the, the FPGA is going to be the master, so the ma it's going to say, I want to read this piece of memory. There's three places that piece of memory can be, the L1 cache, the L2 cache, or the DDR. And the snoop unit apparently will make sure the FPGA sees the right value. And that's why I say when you see the word snoop, you just think magic. Um, so how to exploit that from GNU Radio is, is a very interesting idea, the idea being instead of doing the FFT in the ARM, which we can do OK in NEON, but by doing it in the FPGA, we leave the two ARM cores available to do something else. 
Now you start to expand that. We can put moderate sized GNU radio blocks in the FPGA, figure out how to save state so you can have a serial number is like this, is, this instance operation uses this state stored somewhere in the FPGA. And you could put basically most of your flow graph back in the FPGA. And the ARM is basically just doing the management of the memory and the ARM, the task the ARM is good at, the FPGA can do the operations the FPGA is good at, and it just all works together to be really cool. And a lot of that basically means we need to have fairly good management over the GNU radio buffer space so that we know how to tell the FPGA the physical addresses of the DDR because remember your user space process is going to be using virtual memory addresses and user space doesn't get to know what the physical addresses are. So there'll have to be a little bit of a helper function in the kernel to map the user space information from GNU radio into the physical address space the FPGA is in. So there's a lot of cool stuff there that I think needs to be thought about how to do this really well in GNU radio. And I think there's some really, really exciting things that GNU radio can do to make the E200 work really well with GNU radio. It means you can run two blocks at once. Instead of single threaded. And is that really scaled? Do we know yet? I, I would imagine it would scale much like it does for Intel. Okay, I mean, it's basically SMP code, so it's going to scale like it would for Intel. And I think, you know. I don't know. I mean, and if there's an answer to that question, I think it would work exactly the same in, in x86 space, yeah. right? So if there was a way to improve the thread per block scheduler by taking advantage of number of knowledge of cores, it would just make, it would, it would be a win for both architectures. Um, because obviously one day we may have quad core arms. I mean, quad A15s would be awesome. Um, I don't think A15s exist in silicon, so don't get excited. But. So I find, the, I mean, the FPGA stuff, the idea of making GNU Radio like run blocks in an FPGA, even if you just pre allocate blocks, you know, an FFT block, a forward error correction block, and working out how to integrate that into the scheduler so that it just sent messages to the FPGA what to do. And then it would just go futz with the memory. And so the ACP is just directly to FPGA? Yeah, the FPGA. Uh, the co like no, you write the coprocessor, right? You just write the coprocessor, and it reads from one piece of memory and writes to another, for example. Sorry. I'm going dark. I don't know. I mean, they've got so many dependencies on stuff. They might have, I mean, I, it, it sounds like they need a lot of internal information from Xilinx, and they may be able to get that from this. I mean, my concern with a lot of that stuff is getting it into the wild, into the hands of the general public. And what I am really interested in is encouraging everyone here to do work on GNU Radio to make it better. Um, because obviously, you know, one guy can't do it all. And the FPGA stuff is really cool. I mean, but to get the E200 out the door, you know, my focus will be getting UHD support into the E200 so that we can basically have something, get samples into GNU Radio, and then hopefully that will motivate people to work on GNU Radio to make it much, much better. Yes? Okay, so the question is, um, 
there are some performance penalties going in and out of the neon unit. And Okay, so there are two parts of the question. Um, the Cortex-A8 unit had like a 20-cycle stall when you stored from neon back into ARM registers or back out to, to RAM. So there, there are two pieces to the puzzle. If you're doing small, you know, given that you have the stall, you want to chain a lot of neon operations, so you want to stay in the neon registers as long as you can before you go back to memory. GNU Radio has some fairly fine-grained blocks, like an add block. So you could do a SIMD add, you know, add four numbers in parallel and then store. Um, obviously, if you were going to add four numbers and then do another mathematical operation, you'd want to skip the store. So because of the fine-grained nature of GNU Radio, it could really be hurt by such a thing unless you had the knowledge to write bigger function blocks. And this is sort of a, an ongoing topic of discussion you know, is maybe you, bigger blocks are faster because you can optimize the internals better than, than going back to RAM and for, back and forth to RAM. So there's a strong argument for having big blocks on embedded systems. Um, the other piece of the puzzle is what I said earlier was the differences between A8 and A9 are mostly internal, and the understanding is the A9 doesn't have the store penalty anymore. So the pipelining has been straightened out. Basically, the pipes got straighter, so they don't have the penalty that you saw in the A8. So that changes the equation as well. But I would say that you probably want to chain up a fair number of operations in the NEON unit because you don't want to read from RAM, do the NEON operation, and then store to RAM. You probably want to do you know, half a dozen if you possibly can, just common sense kind of stuff. Um, and this, I, I think there's probably been paper, people have wrote stuff on software-defined radio where you're doing block-structured stuff. You know, do you have, like, every little operation configurable, and then you can draw these infinitely complex flow graphs? Or do you have a few blocks that are fairly dense? Um, and, of course, my mind both. Yes. I, the way I would do that in GNU Radio is use hierarchical blocks with the fine grain stuff inside of them, and then when you see them become performance problems, rewrite them as um, monolithic blocks. So I, there are ways of handling that inside GNU Radio. And yes. Um, my, the short answer is I wouldn't trust the compiler to vectorize very well. Um, I've heard that GCC is getting better and not generating vector solutions that crash, uh, which it was at one point. So you can turn on the vectorizer, but the problem with just running a dumb vectorizer, the Intel one I think has had a lot of work put into it, so it can see the optimizations better. But even so, I think in a lot of algorithms you kind of have to the way you code it in C, you, you sort of have to use tricks to get it to parallelize well. And the, the compiler probably isn't going to see those. Complex multiplies would be an example. Because it's kind of funny how you do them. And I would kind of, I've never looked at what GCC does for complex multiplies. But it might not do very well, and you might have to hand code it anyway. It's entirely possible that ORC could do a little bit better there. Because it may know the optimiz if it sees complex in, it may know the optimizations. I would kind of suspect that GCC would have a chance at complex multiplies. You could see them figuring it out eventually. I, basically, the guys that do uh, hand assembled stuff aren't going to be unemployed anytime soon. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay, does anyone else have any sort of general questions or should we go ahead and get Tom up here? To, yeah. Um, is that one shipping? Yeah, I, I've heard rumors that Altera has a part, but I don't know if it's shipping yet. Um, I'm just not that familiar with the Altera line. It, it seems like Xilinx has been kicking their butt lately in this stuff. I think they had some automotive part, but I'm not really super aware of 
you know, what its specs are. And I've heard they've got like a cool one, but it's not shipping. So that, that's kind of my knowledge there.